Abdul Qadir, and I am a fourth year medical student. Uh, today I will be giving you basically a cardiology question of you. I tried to bring questions from your world, Amboss, Robbins, and what I've done is I brought questions and then for some of the more important topics, I kind of put a little summary slide afterwards to just bring everything together. So what I think I'm gonna do is I'll show you the question. I'll give you like a minute or so to read the question. Then you guys can answer in the chat or if you wanna open your mic and answer, you can do that as well. And then after you get your answers, I'm going to kind of go over the question and the answer and then why that's the right answer. Okay, so we'll start with the first question then. Okay, a 56 year old man comes to the emergency department due to chest palpitations, feels that his heartbeat is very fast and very irregular. The patient has no chest pain, shortness of breath or dizziness. Physical examination confirms the presence of an irregularly irregular rhythm with a heart rate of 120 per minute. He hosted a party last night for his wife's birthday and consumed a large amount of alcohol. The patient normally drinks only two to three times a year. He is otherwise healthy and takes no medications. Which of the following ECG findings is most likely in this patient? So you can type in chat what if you think it's A, B, C, D, or E. Okay, so the correct answer here is is A. Um, absent P waves. Now, absent P waves is indicative of atrial fibrillation. So if we go here, AFib is the most common cardiac arrhythmia. Uh, here you can see some of the characteristics are absent P waves, irregularly irregular R intervals, and a narrow QRS complex. And if you can see in the question here, they mention specifically irregularly irregular rhythm. That's pathognomonic for, that's pathognomonic for um, uh, risk factors include hypertension and uh, CAD. Uh, however, here it can be precipitated by alcohol consumption. So if we go back to the question and said that for his wife's birthday, he consumed a large amount of alcohol, so that may have precipitated this AFib. Um, and so an important thing to note in AFib is that it can cause thromboemboli, which can get lodged in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the brain and cause stroke. And that's an important sequelae of AFib. So we can see here in the picture down here, you can see the, there's no P waves. You can see there's absent P waves. You can see that there's no pattern, irregularly irregular RR intervals. Um, for management, uh, the main management is uh, class two, class four antiarrhythmics. You can do cardioversion which is basically shocking the heart back to normal rhythm. But if you do cardio, uh, cardio version, it's important to use anticoagulants for the same reason earlier, uh, which is the mural thrown by. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. Okay, let's read through this together. Um, a 54-year-old man comes to the office due to episodic brain and substernal chest pain. His pain increases with activity and improves with rest. The patient has history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia. 
He has smoked a pack of cigarettes daily for the past 30 years. His blood pressure is 140 over 85 and his pulse is 76. Cardiac auscultation reveals S4 heart sound. Lung and abdominal examinations are unremarkable. His ECG at rest shows left ventricular hypertrophy. A myocardial perfusion scan reveals induced ischemia of the inferior surface of the heart. Which of the following are coronary arteries is most likely occluded? So um, when, we're looking, when we're looking at this question, first thing we see is that he has uh, episodic substernal chest pain, right? They mentioned that it's angina. They mentioned here that it's ischemia of the inferior surface of the heart. That's the most important thing that we're looking at right here. And so if we think of the inferior surface of the heart, the arteries that supply it are the PDA, right? And so the PDA is a branch of the right coronary artery in most people. That's the right dominance, left dominance, right? And so in this case, the right answer would be D, right coronary artery. So if you look here, as I mentioned, inferior portion of the heart is supplied by the PDA. And if um, the PDA is occluded, that will lead to ischemia. Uh, and so here I mentioned that in most people, 90% of uh, people, PDA arrives from the right coronary artery. Uh, the most common artery in the MI is actually the left anterior descending, which will cause the anterior anterior septal myocardial infarction. Another important thing to note in a right coronary artery MI is that it can affect the SA and AV node because these two are supplied by the right coronary artery. So that can lead to a bradyarrhythmia, heart block, et cetera. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. Okay, a 69-year-old man is brought to the emergency department with sudden onset palpitations and dyspnea. His, medical, his past medical history is significant for hypertension and gastroesophageal reflux disease. An electrocardiogram reveals a heart rate of 120 beats per minute with an irregular, with an irregular rhythm, narrow QRS complex, and no P waves. Which of the following physiologic factors most likely determines the ventricular contraction rate in this patient? Uh, someone said D in the chat. Okay. Um, in this case, so what they're basically saying by when they say no P waves, that means the SA node isn't functioning, right? And so if, when the SA node isn't functioning, the next thing you want to look at, the next thing after the SA node is the AV node. And so in this case, the ventricular contraction rate is, is, is seen due to the AV node refractory period. What does that mean? The refractory period basically is the time in which the heart is unable to contract again. And so in this case, with no SA node, the heart rate is determined by the AV node. So the answer here would be B, not D. Does that make sense? If anything doesn't make sense, you can ask me to clarify and I can do my best. Okay, perfect. Um, we'll move on to the next question then. Okay, a 20 year old man comes to the office due to recurrent heart palpitations that start and stop abruptly. After initial workup, the physician suspected that there is an abnormal conduction pathway in this patient's heart that by bypasses the atrioventricular node. Assuming the diagnosis is correct, which part of the patient's ECG is most likely to be affected by uh, during normal sinus rhythm? Was it A, B, C, D, or E? What do you think? Okay, correct. Uh, it, is, it is B. And so what is the disease here? Do you know what the disease is? So when, when, when they refer to a abnormal conduction pathway that bypasses the AV node, what they're referring to here is Wolf Parkinson White. And that accessory pathway is known as the bundle of Kent. So what happens here is that this 
uh, accessory pathway causes the ventricle to contract a little earlier than normal. And so that causes this delta wave. And that delta wave is here around where B would be. And that delta wave causes um, shortening of the PR interval and widening of the QRS complex. Does that make sense? Perfect, okay. Uh, next question. A six year, eight year old man has worsening dyspnea and orthopnea for the past three years with increased production of frothy sputum. On examination, crackles are auscultated at the lung bases. A chest radiograph shows bilateral interstitial infiltrates, distinct curly B lines, and prominent left heart border. Laboratory studies show sodium of 135, potassium of 3.8, chloride of 99, CO2 of 25, glucose 76, creatine of 1.5, urea nitrogen of 30, fractional excretion of sodium less than 1%, plasma renin, aldosterone, and ADH levels are all increased. BNP is 200. What is the most likely diagnosis? Now, this obviously this is a cardiology review, so the answer here is probably obvious, but the reason I put this question in here is because I wanted you to see what kind of uh, features they put in the questions to kind of lead you towards the diagnosis. The answer here is congestive heart failure. And so what are the things that make you think congestive heart failure? You see here, you see dyspnea, you see orthopnea, which means when you're lying supine, you become out of breath. Um, you see here crackles, all right? You see bilateral infiltrates, you see distinct curly B lines, right? Prominent left heart border, which could mean um, ventricular hypertrophy. And then the rest of the laboratory values here and like the, the fractional excretion of sodium, this is basically to try and puts you off of the other, um, the other options here. Uh, and so does anyone know why uh, BNP might be elevated here? So yeah, it is it is it is um it is indicative of it's good for diagnosing heart failure, but it's in the sense that it's a good negative predictive value, meaning a normal BNP means there's most likely not heart failure. So BNP is a uh, brain-derived nat natriuretic peptide, I believe. Uh, it's similar to ANP, which is uh, derived from the atrium. It's a BNP is derived from the vent the ventricles, and it's uh it's uh, released in response to increased tension. And so what it will do is it'll dilate the afferent ar arterioles of the kidney and then constrict the efferent arterioles to try and get more uh, fluid out of the uh, kidneys and try to get more fluid out, right? It's seen, so in this case, it is elevated. I, I, I hope that made sense. I kind of, I kind of, got uh, confused a little bit. It's not specific for, C for CHF in the sense that a high BNP doesn't necessarily mean that it's heart failure, but it's used so a low BNP would mean that it's not heart failure. So it's a negative predictive value. Okay, um, here, just, just some basics on heart failure. Um, some of the clinical features that you should be looking for, dyspnea, orthopnea, uh, pulmonary edema. Uh, this is more seen in left heart failure because the blood gets pulled up in the lungs. Uh, jugular venous distension, congestive hepatomegaly. So this is more seen in right heart failure, but left heart failure is a cause of right heart failure. So you can see it in both uh, depend dependent pitting edema. So like lower leg pitting edema, uh, fatigue, rails and crackles. And obviously, so these are some of the main causes of heart failure. And I believe in the lectures, they like to tell you that diabetes is a risk factor. So it can be a risk factor because diabetes is a risk factor for CAD and hypertension. So in that way, it's also a risk factor for heart failure. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, a 41-year-old man comes to the emergency department due to three days of fever, chills, and non-productive cough. The patient has also felt tired and weak during this period. He has a history of injection of drug use, of injection drug use, and has been hospitalized several times for injection cell cellulitis. Temperature is 38.3, blood pressure is 125 over 72, the pulse is 112, 
Uh, cardiopulmonary auscultation reveals scattered ronchi and a cardiac murmur, which are not pr previously present. Laboratory evaluation shows leukocytosis. A chest X-ray reveals nodular opacities. Echocardiography of this patient is most likely to reveal which of the following findings. What do we think the answer is? Okay, yeah, F. Uh, so what is the disease here? Okay. Infective endocarditis, correct. Um, so just some basics on infect, uh, infective endocarditis. So in acute infective endocarditis, which is what we see here, so three days, uh, the most likely agent is Staph aureus. Additionally, seen calmly in IVD users, you'll see these, this a lot in questions. A lot of uh, questions, will have, they'll say IVD, first thought, tri, uh, tricuspid valve Staph aureus, right? Uh, it's large, large vegetations um, and rapid onset. That's, that's important as well, because sometimes they'll bring you pictures they did this with us. They brought us pick. They brought pictures and they said, "Okay, what is the organism or what? You know, what are you looking at?" Uh, Subacute, you see in Stravaridans. Okay, see smaller vegetations, uh, often seen on already diseased valves and seen after dental procedures. So in the question send, they'll say, "Okay, the patient had a history of a dental procedure and whatnot." Um, mitral valve is the one that's most commonly uh, affected here, and then after that, it's aortic valve. Uh, subacute is seen more often than acute. So in general, if they ask you what valve is most seen and uh, most affected in infective endocarditis, the answer is most likely mitral. Um, but if they give you like a, something like IVD, then you want to lead towards tricuspid. Uh, some more important things, if it's prosthetic, then you want to think of epidermi epidermidis, um, GI, enterococcus, uh, colon cancer. This came on our exam. Um, so they put strep bovis on our exam, I believe, but that's more of like a micro question. And then the gram negative, these are seen less often, but they're the HASIC organisms. Um, if, does anyone know what HASIC stands for? <laughs> yeah, uh, H. influenza, uh, actinobacillus, cardiobacterium, echinella, and kingella. Those are the HASIC organisms. Uh, additionally, you want to, for Lipman sacs, this is also an important one. It's uh, associated with lupus, and it's really important to know that it's seen on both sides of the valve. Again, they brought us, he brought us a picture of a vegetation with both valves on both sides. He said, what are you looking at? The answer is Lipman sacs. Um, these are the signs you want to look for in infective endocarditis, fever, rough spots seen in the eyes, Osler nodes, which are uh, tender nodes, uh, and the heart murmur in this case would be um, mitral regurge, or in this case, tricuspid regurge, Janeway lesions, which are also similar to Osler nodes, but non-tender, uh, anemia, splinter hemorrhage, hemorrhages uh, in the fingernails, and then embolize. Does anyone have any questions about um, these are not really criteria. These are more just signs that you want to look out for. Criteria, you might be thinking of like the, the Jones criteria for major would be culture. And easy. Yeah, so again, the, those, that's not really like criteria per se. That's just things you want to, you, you want, you want to do if you expect an infective endocarditis. Not, not both leaflets. I mean, if, if the valve is like this, right, this is both leaflets. So it'll be on this side of the valve and this side of the valve. So on both sides. I believe there's a picture in your, in your, in your PowerPoint that explains it better than I do. So I, I, I'd refer back to a broadest PowerPoint because uh, if you guys don't know, like he'll bring the exact same picture from your lecture and you'll put it as an MCQ or an OSPI question, and you'll, and it's the exact same picture. So I'd memorize all the pictures from his lectures. Okay, next question. A seven-year-old boy is brought to the physician because of a five-day history of fever, malaise, and joint pain. He had a sore throat four weeks ago that resolved without treatment. His temperature is 38.6, and blood pressure is 84 over 62. 
Physical exam showed several firm, painless nodules under the skin near his elbows in the dorsal aspect of both wrists. Cardiopulmonary examination shows basal, uh, bilateral basal crackles and blowing holosystolic murmur heard best at the cardiac apex. Both knee joints are warm. Laboratory studies show an erythrocytes to the sedimentation rate of 129. The immu immune response seen in this patient is most likely due to the presence of which of the following. Okay, yeah, perfect. E. So what is the what is the disease here? Yeah, room, yeah, exactly. Rheumatoid fever. Um and so rheumatoid fever, the this this is the the major criteria, rheumatoid fever. This is uh you can use a Jones criteria. That's uh, that's that's the one that most people use. Um so this is joints, you see poly, polyarthritis, uh, pancarditis, you see subacute, or you see nodules, you see what's known as erythema marginatum, and then sydenum scoria. Uh, rheumatoid fever is associated with group A strep infection, like you mentioned, strep pyogenes. Uh, and, and the question here is asking, what is the immune response? So it's a type two hypersensitivity reaction, this molecular mimicry to the M protein, which is similar to the protein seen in the heart. And so an antibody reaction to that protein will lead to antibodies attacking the heart. Uh, my, the mitral valve is the one that's most commonly affected and it causes regurgitation, but if it keeps happening, then over time, it'll cause stenosis. If it affects the aortic valve, it can cause fusion of the commissures. And that I believe is the fish mouth appearance. Um, and it can also cause uh, subacute endocarditis. It can predispose to it, sorry. And then the two things, uh, two main titers that you want to look at, there's obviously other ones, but these are the two that they like to ask about a lot is the ASO titers and then the anti-DNA titers. It's a pretty, pretty easy concept that gets heavily tested on. So I suggest like, you know it pretty well. Uh, any questions? Okay, we'll move on then. A 34-year-old man comes to the emergency department with fatigue and lightheadedness. The patient had an upper respiratory tract infection last week, and since then his energy level has been low with shortness of breath and mild exertion. Otherwise, his medical history is insignificant. He is a lifetime non-smoker. The patient's temperature is 37, blood pressure is 80 over 60, and pulse is 120. His pulse became, becomes undetectable due to palpation during inspiration. The lungs are cleared to auscultation. The jugular veins are distended. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? I'll give you guys a few minutes to think about the answer. This one's a little bit... Puffer. What do you guys think it is? Okay, so the answer here is actually not B or D. The answer here is cardiac tamponade, it's C. Oh. So what is the triad of cardiac tamponade? It is hypotension, jugular venous distension, and distant heart sounds. It's important to know this. Uh, here you can see that they mentioned jugular venous distension, he has hypotension, and then they say here that his pulse, or his, uh, his pulse becomes undetectable. This is not the, this is actually what's known as pulses paradoxes. I'm not sure if you, if, if this was mentioned in your lecture, but pulses paradoxes basically means that while they're inspiring, their pulse, their systolic blood pressure decreases. And so what, so if you're, if you're taking their pulse, then you'll notice while they're inspiring, while they're breathing in, you can't feel their pulse anymore. And so that's also a finding in, um, that's also, sorry, it's also a finding here in, in cardiac tamponade. So these are the things you want, you want to look for is, again, hypotension, jugular venous distension, and distant heart sounds. Classic triad. Um, and so normally what cardiac tamponade is, is it's just anything, anything, is it the dancing heart on echo? 
Um, I'm not sure what that is, so I, I can't really give you the answer for that. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what the dancing heart is. <laughs> so what cardiac tamponade is, is any fluid basically compressing on the heart. It can be any effusion or fluid. Uh, often it's idiopathic, although it can be due to any virus. It can be due to acute pericarditis, heart failure, anything that causes fluid to surround the heart. Um, it's not as heavily tested, but I thought it'd be important to add because if you see it, if you see this triad, then you'll know that it's cardiac tamponade. Okay, we'll move on. A 32 year old woman comes to the emergency department with lightheadedness and shortness of breath, was struggled while shopping at a supermarket. During the last six months, she had increasing shortness of breath and had to adjust her daily activities. The patient has no other medical problems and does not use tobacco, alcohol, or illicit drugs. There is no family history of heart disease, stroke, or blood clots. After initial assessment, the patient reports that she feels fine, refuses further evaluation, and insists on being discharged. She dies a month later. At autopsy, her heart has the following appearance. What is the most likely diagnosis? Oh. So this, this is the right ventricle, and then this is the left ventricle. I don't know if you can see that. What do you think the answer is? Okay, why, why, why do you say E? So the answer here is E, but why is it E? That's, that's the question. Exactly. If you can see here in the picture, the right ventricle is not supposed to be larger than the left ventricle. So here, the right ventricle, ventricle is substantially enlarged. And so that is due to pulmonary arterial hypertension. It's a, it's a pretty simple question. So it just, it just basically, you just got to look at the, the right ventricle. You see that it's, it's, not even, it's not even supposed to be larger. It's, here you can see it's larger than left ventricle. That's not normal. Perfect. Okay. Um, exactly. Core pulmonary. Uh, we'll move on to the next question. If anyone has any questions, again, just, just feel free to type them in the chat. Okay, a 32 year old man comes to the emergency department with chest pain that started earlier in the day. The pain is midline and sharp and increases with deep breaths, but decreases when the patient leans forward. He had a mild, mild respiratory illness a week ago. Other medical history is unremarkable. The patient is a lifetime non-smoker and has no family history of early onset heart attack, sudden death or cardiomyopathy. Blood pressure is 120 over 70, pulse is 110. Which of the following physical findings should we expect on this patient? Okay, yeah, this, is, this, is, this one's also pretty easy. Uh, the answer is A, friction rub, because this is, yes, pericarditis. Um, what makes us think, what makes us think is pericarditis? The main thing that I look at is, um, why is it? okay, the main thing I look at is, is here increase with deep breaths and decreases with movement especially moving forward um if we look here the most common type of pericarditis is the frivolous type uh it's often idiopathic but presumed to be caused by a viral infection so here we can see that he had a mild respiratory illness most likely a viral infection and that viral infection uh the most common one is coxsackie b uh that viral infection led to the pericarditis um here we say it's sharp pain aggravated by inspiration, relieved by sitting up and bored. And so the reason that it's relieved is because it causes decreased pressure on the parietal pericardium, which causes, which relieves the pain. I hope that makes sense. We'll move on to the next question. Okay, a 60 year old woman has reported increasing fatigue over the past year. Laboratory studies show a serum creatinine of 4.7, a urea, urea nitrogen level of 44, abdominal ultrasound, uh, ultrasound scan shows that her kidneys are symmetrical, sm symmetrically smaller than normal. The high magnification microscopic appearance of the kidneys is shown. These findings are most likely to indicate which of the following underlying conditions.
I believe this 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 picture is from your lecture, by the way. So I I, I would memorize these pictures, or especially like any picture from your lecture again. Just memorize it. Yes, the answer is B. What is the disease? Highline arterial sclerosis. Yes. So the main the main thing you want to look at here is the picture. Like you can look, you can obviously look at some things in the question, but the main the main thing you want to look at is the picture. You can see there's a thickening of the wall. What you don't want to get this confused with is the hyperplastic arterial sclerosis, which causes the classic onion skinning. Um, I'll show you a picture of that here, so you can see the difference, right? So you don't want to get these confused. This is hyaline. This is hyperplastic. Hyaline is due to a plasma protein leak. It's seen. It's important. Seen in essential, which is non-malignant. This is just hypertension or diabetes. Um, and then hyperplastic is seen in severe malignant hypertension. And then this onion, onion skinning is specific to hyperplastic. So try to separate these two pictures in your mind so that you can easily recognize this on the exam. Okay. A 30 year old woman has had coldness and numbness in her arms and decreased vision in the right eye for the past five months. On physical examination, she's afibrile, her blood pressure is 100 over 70, radial pulses are non palpable but femoral pulses are strong. She has decreased sensation and cyanosis in her arms, but no warmth or swelling. The chest radiograph shows a prominent border on the right side of the heart and prominence of the pulmonary arteries. Lab studies show serum glucose 74, creatinine 1, total serum cholesterol 165, negative ANA. Her condition remains stable for the next year, which the following is most likely diagnosis. Okay, yeah, that was pretty fast. Okay, D. Uh, why do we say D? What what gives this away? Okay, yeah. So young woman, that's a, that's one thing. Pulselessness, yep, exactly. Uh, those are the main two things we're looking at. Um, if we if we can, exactly vision that yeah vision problems also. Um, but this so the radial pulse is not being palpable, so that's something that's though it's called pulselessness, pulseless disease, right? Um, here I have kind of an overview of the different uh, vasculitis. It's kind of, this is more of like a diagram form, but I took the, the graph from your lecture because I, I liked it. It, it kind of, it's, it's, it's as ridiculously simple. I, 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 it was pretty, it's pretty nice. So what you want to do is you want to separate them into large, medium, and small, but there's some extra stuff not mentioned here that I think are pretty important. Like for instance, in uh, giant cell arthritis, you see, you can see it's associated. What's is, what's it associated with? Does anyone know? Major association. Yeah, blindness because it affects the ophthalmic artery. It can also it can also have headaches, something called jaw claudication. These are all things associated with temporal or uh, giant cell arthritis. It also has granulomas. That's something that's important as well. Um, for Takayasu. Um, it's commonly seen in uh, young Asian women, like you guys said, uh, also has granulomas. Uh, for polyarthritis nodosa, it affects, which, it affects almost everything except for the lungs. Additionally, yes, associated with hepatitis B, uh, causes renal microorgan uh, aneurysms, sorry, and fibrinoid necrosis. Uh, for Kawasaki disease, seen in young Asian children, uh, what you, want to, what you want to think of for Kawasaki disease is the pneumonic called crash and burn. Uh, C for conjunctivitis, R for rash, A for adenopathy, so like lymph nodes. Um, S for strawberry tongue, uh, H for hand and foot edema and erythema, and then burn is fever. So if you see those on a question stem, young, child, Asian, Kawasaki. And just an ad, added tidbit is... Uh, treated with aspirin IVIG. It's one of the only diseases in which you give aspirin in, to kids because uh, why don't you want to give aspirin to kids? What, what are you scared of? Ray syndrome, yeah. Um, for GPA, uh, it's associated with Cianca. And so the way I believe it's the, oh my God, the way he says it is you want to think of it as the C disease because it, the way it affects the body is kind of like a C as well. It affects the nasopharynx, the lungs, and the kidneys. 
And so that kind of makes a C with your body. Uh, so say with C Anka, and then it's called Wegner's. You can make it like change the G with the C Wegner's. It just makes them easier to remember. Also associated with granulomas in the name. Uh, Church Strauss, eosinophils, P Anka, asthma. You see any kind of atopic dermatitis, something like that. You know, it's most likely to be Church Strauss. Uh, for MPA, it's important to know that it's it's there's no granulomas because it can be very similar. The presentation can be very similar to GPA. So there's no nasopharyngeal involvement and there's no granulomas. Also, it's Pianka. So those are the main differences between them. And that's what you got to kind of look out for. Uh, any questions on that? No questions. Okay, perfect. Move on to the next question then. A 41-year-old man has had increasing dyspnea for the past week. On physical examination, temperature is 37, pulse is 85, respirations are 20, and blood pressure is 150 over 95. There's dullness to percussion over the lungs, chest radiograph shows bilateral, large bilateral pleural effusions, and a normal heart size. Laboratory findings include serum creatinine of 3.1, nitrogen 29, troponin uh, 0 0.1, WBC 3760, hemoglobin 11.7, and a positive ANA and anti double stranded DNA antibody test results, which the following cardiac lesions is most likely to be present in this patient. This is a bit of a harder one, not gonna lie. Um, so, so the answer here is positive ANA and positive anti-double-stranded DNA is basically means it's lupus. So knowing now that it's lupus, what would you say the answer is? D, exactly. So this is, this is more of a tougher question because you guys haven't taken MSI yet, but uh, ANA, antinuclear antibodies, is basically means autoimmune disease, and then double-stranded DNA is more specific for lupus. So lupus, as we know, is, a, is associated with Lyman sacs. Uh, as I said earlier, vegetation is both sides of the valve. Uh, I think that's, that's, that's pretty much it for this question. Um, okay. A 55-year-old man with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, type 2 diabetes, and asthma comes to the physician because of a two-month history of intermittent dry hacking cough. He does not have fever, chest pain, or shortness of breath. He does not smoke cigarettes. Current medications include simvastatin, metformin, albuterol, and remipril. His temperature is 37, pulse is 87, and blood pressure is 142 over 88. A uh, CVP exam shows no abnormalities, which is the following is most appropriate initial action by the physician. Okay, why is it C? Why is the answer C here? Okay, yeah. So it says that his, his chief complaint is dry cough. And one of the side effects of ACE inhibitors, which Romipril is an ACE inhibitor, is dry cough, right? And so you won't be able to tell if his condition is getting better if you keep him on the ACE inhibitors. And so that's why you switch him to an angiotensin reception receptor blocker, such as candy sarton. Perfect. Okay. Um, what do you guys know? What are the, what are the other uh, side effects of ACE inhibitors? Angiodema. Yeah, that's what, that's the, that's the other big one. So you're not you're not giving him ACE inhibitors. You're stopping the ACE inhibitor. So he's already on an ACE inhibitor, and you want to stop. So it's asking what is the most appropriate action. So we're here. We're stopping the ACE inhibitor and we're switching him to an ARB. Precisely because he has asthma and he has a two month history of intermittent cough. Another important thing, 
Um, ACE inhibitors, uh, they're, they, they, in heart failure, they can, um, they can reduce cardiac remodeling, stop cardiac remodeling. That's something they told us in the therapeutics lecture that came as, that came as our SAQ. That's another thing you should be aware of. Uh, I don't know why it was given to begin with, uh, ACE inhibitors. This is just part of the question stem. <laughs> I didn't make the question, I'm not sure. Okay. A 50 year old man comes to the physician because of swelling in his legs for two months. Three months ago, he was diagnosed with hypertension and started on a new medication. His blood pressure is 145 over 95. Uh, PE shows two plus edema in both lower extremities. Laboratory studies are within reference ranges. This patient is most likely treated with which of the following drugs? Okay, yeah, it's uh, it's E, amlodipine. It, what is what is amlodipine? Yeah, it's a calcium channel blocker. But what type of calcium channel blocker? Like, there's two types. Yes, dihydropyridine. So this one exactly. So this one works on smooth muscles. And so that's why this causes edema. So often what, what, what will happen is if a patient is on a dihydropyridine CCB and they present with edema and it's affecting their life, uh, the doctor will put them on a non-dihydropyridine such as deltaism. Deltism. Um, does anyone know other common side effects of uh, CCBs? Okay, yeah, constipation, tachycardia, yep, reflex tachycardia, that's an important one. Okay, um, move on to the next question. This is an important one. Okay, two days after being admitted for acute MI, a 61-year-old man has sharp substernal chest pain that worsens with inspiration and improves when leaning forward. Cardiac examination shows scratchy sound best heard over the left sternal border, Histopathological examination of the affected tissue is most likely to show which of the following findings. Okay. Um, yeah, so the answer is A. So this is the really important concept. Again, gets tested really, really heavily. Uh, abroad loves these questions. And so this is uh, what this is is basically the histological and morphological changes after an MI. So you got to know the timings and then what comes in at what time. Now, I, I really like the pathoma explanation, which is basically one day, one week, one month. Um, and so it, it helps me, it helps you understand, first of all, what are the changes? And then what are the associated complications? I, you, I don't think you have to know, you have to know the timings of the complications, but if you know what causes the complications, it'll help you remember all the complications. So in the first day, you get coagulative necrosis. And so necrosis will cause a darkening and dark discoloration, right? And the major complication in the first day is ventricular arrhythmia. This can lead to death. Now, from one to three days, you see neutrophilic, neutrophilic infiltrate. So between one day and one week is the inflammation period. And so it starts with neutrophils and then progresses to macrophages. So with, with neutrophils and macrophages, you, get, you start to get WBCs in the myocardium, right? And so that's what kind of gives you that yellow paler. Uh, the neutrophils, what happens is in a transmural infarct specifically, the neutrophils can leak out into the pericardium and cause fibrinous pericarditis, which is what our guy here had, right? He had sharp so substernal chest pain, worsens the inspiration, improves with leaning forward, uh, scratchy sound, that's pericarditis. And so that's another, another hint to tell you that there's neutrophils involved. Um, after neutrophils comes the macrophages. What do the macrophages do? They eat up the dead necro necrotic cells. And so the necrotic cells, 
uh, once once you've eaten them up, it kind of weakens the ventricular, ventricular wall, right? Not just the ventricular wall, all the walls of the heart. So the septal wall, the ventricular wall. And so what can happen uh, during this time period is that you have rupture. That's the main word. So you can have rupture of the ventricular wall, rupture of the intraventricular septum. You can have rupture of the papillary muscles. So all these things can happen because of the macrophages. And so this happens late, later in the first week. And so after one week, that's when the granulation tissue uh, starts to form, right? And so the granulation tissue, that's when you kind of start seeing the red blood vessels, erythema, right? So the red border is due to the granulation tissue. And so that happens after the first week. And so it takes about, oh, for one week, it takes about a month, two months to, for that granulation tissue to turn into fibrosis. And then to kind of um, compare this to your lecture, it's similar, but I would, if there's any differences, I would follow whatever is written in your lecture. It's more, it's more like specific in terms of timing, but as you can see, most of the stuff is the same, right? Within the first day, cognitive necrosis, uh, dark modeling, right? One to three days, that's when you start seeing infiltrated neutrophils, right? Three to seven days, it says phagocytosis of dead cells or macrophages, right? Same as what, what was said in plasma. Um, seven to 10 days, it says early formation, right? Early formation of granulation tissue. So that's after, that's after the first week. And then within two weeks is when you get the well-established granulation tissue, right? And then here as well, you can see that the red tan margins, because what happens is that the granulation tissue comes from the outside, not from the inside. So you get the red borders. Uh, and then it takes about a month, two months for the scar to start forming. And then here it says more than two months for it to be a dense collagenous scar. So I hope that kind of summarizes the findings. I hope that kind of makes it easier to understand. This table is very important. You should also, there's pictures. Um, I, didn't, I didn't bring the pictures. I probably should, but I didn't bring the pictures, but you should probably memorize the pictures associated with this too, because you'll bring that for sure. Um, we'll move on to the next question. If you have any questions on this, you can let me know. Okay, an investigator is studying the effects of drugs on the cardiac action potential. Cardiomyocytes are infused with pharmacological agents and incubated for five minutes, after which the action potential is registered on a graph in real time for two minutes. The black line represents an action potential followed following the infusion of a pharmac pharmacological agent. The results shown in the graph are most likely caused by an agent that inhibits which of the following. Okay, what do you think the answer is here? So let's look at the question carefully, okay? Um, it asks with the results show a graph that are most likely caused by an agent that inhibits, which of the following. Correct, it's D, right? So for what, what, is, the, what is the agent here? Anyone know? Class one. Yeah, this is most likely class 1B, correct. Um, it could also be class 1C, uh, judging by the slope. Uh, okay, uh, so for antiarrhythmics, it's really important that you know the normal action potential because if you know the normal action potential very well, then you can kind of understand the antiarrhythmics even better, right? And so if you can see here on the left, this is the myocardial action potential. Right, and you can see also how it associates with the QRS and the ECG, right? And so anything that changes the sodium or phase zero will lengthen the QRS, right? And then anything the, that affects phase three or potassium will lengthen QT. So that's kind of, so if, if you can understand this association, it'll make all the side effects and effects really easy to understand. So class two and class four antiarrhythmics work on the nodal right here, on the nodal action potential. And then class one and class three work mostly on the myocardium. Um, if you look here, this is a just basically a summary of all the uh, antiarrhythmics. We see here, this is class one A. 
And so it works on both sodium and potassium, right? And so you'll have prolonged action potential, right? And then you also have prolonged QT because potassium is affected here. Um, you have class 1B, which actually lowers potassium and then uh, inhibits sodium. And then you, you, can basically, you can basically look at this if, if you want at your own time. Um, here's the basic summary of them. Uh, quinidine procanamide block sodium channels. Uh, you can see this is, these are some of the side effects. One of the important side effects of quinidine is, is drug-induced lupus. Uh, you'll see antihistone antibodies there. Uh, also causes QT prolongation because of the potassium class 3 like effects. Uh, lidocaine, uh, phenytoin, these block inactive channels. So these are used more in ischemic tissue post MI. Uh, here. And then flacanide, uh, that's a 1C. And this has the strongest affinity for sodium channels. So it can completely block the active potential, often used as a more of a last resort drug. Uh, here we have class two, which is the beta blockers. These work on the AV node. They stop the sympathetic activity. Um, class three, these, this is probably the one that gets tested on the most. Uh, amiodarone, really important one. So Sotolol is both class three and class two. Um, amiodarone has effects for all the classes, so it can be used in all arrhythmias, but you just gotta be careful with amiodarone because um, it can cause many dysfunctions, which uh, I'll probably get into a little bit later. And then class four is the calcium channel blockers, which also slows down the SA node and AB node, actually. Uh, any questions on the antiarrhythmics? Oh, one more thing I want to add for anything that prolongs the QT, uh, what is a main complication of a prolonged QT? What can it lead to? Not VFib. Yes, trosadzepon. Exactly. So twisting of the points, it'll, you know, it looks like this. VFib is more chaotic. Okay. Move on to the next question. Yeah. Uh, an otherwise healthy 27-year-old woman is referred to a cardiologist because of a murmur detected by her general practitioner during a routine health maintenance examination. She has a history of recurrent episodes of sore throat and fever during childhood. She immigrated from Kenya six years ago. Cardiac examination shows an opening snap followed by a late diastolic rumble, which is best heard at the fifth intercostal space in the left midclavicular line. Which of the following pressure volume loops uh, is most likely to correspond with the patient's cardiac condition? So yeah, the answer here is D. Uh, what is the condition? Correct, natural stenosis. So opening snap followed by late diastolic rumble. That is mitral stenosis. Yep. Um, and then it says here, so recurrent episodes of sore throat and fever during childhood. As I said, rheumatic fever initially causes regurg, but recurrent episodes will eventually lead to stenosis. So that's what happened here. She, she had recurrent episodes of rheumatic fever, which caused the mitral stenosis. Um, I'll just so these. This is basically a summary of the heart about the, the the murmurs. If you, if you think about it, of like where the blood is going at all times, so. If it's during diastole, it's going through the mitral and tricuspid valves. So what are the possible valves that could be affected during diastole? Um, e, e basically means um, ventricular systolic failure. So the end diastolic volume is, is, is really high because the ventricle is unable to contract. Uh, it's unlikely that they'll bring this one. You have the, the other ones are the ones that you should worry about more. Those are the ones they'll, they're more likely to bring, right? Well, what, what, what is A? Aerotic stenosis, what is B? Mm 
Macho Regrets and C. Eretic Regrets, exactly. And then D, we said Macho Stenosis. So these are the four that they're more most likely to test you on. They'll bring you in one of these and they'll say, okay, what are you looking at? So I, I think it came in OSPI for us, if I remember correctly. Uh, so yeah, you should know these graphs pretty well. Uh, know the murmurs. So systolic murmurs, you'll hear aortic or pulmonary stenosis. Uh, aortic stenosis is classically crescendo decrescendo, radiates the keratids. They'll say radiates the keratids or radiates the neck. Um, it can be caused by wear and tear, can be caused by bicuspid aortic valve. Um, clinically, you see syncope, angina, and dyspnea. That's what the SAD stands for. Um, also, systolic murmurs, uh, mitral regurge, we'll see hollow systolic murmur, and then mitral valve prolapse, which is late crescendo with a mid systolic click. Uh, diastolic murmurs, aortic regurge, early diastolic decrescendo. And then here uh, you'll see a high pulse pressure, which basically means the systolic is, high, is higher than normal, the diastolic is lower than normal. And then you'll see classically head bobbing, bounding pulse. I'm not sure if that was if you guys were taught that, but that's just something that's important for if you're taking boards. Um, mitral stenosis, as, as, as shown in our example, is opening snap with diastolic rumble. Uh, what, uh, let me ask you a question then. What is a machine-like murmur? What is that associated with? Yeah, PDA. Okay, uh, we'll move on to the next question. This one's a little bit tricky. A 14-year-old boy comes to the physician for a follow-up after a blood test showed serum triglyceride levels of 821. Several of his family members have familial hypertriglyceridemia. The patient is described as prescribed a drug that increases his risk of gallstone disease. The expected beneficial effect of this drug is most likely due to which of the following actions. What do we think? Let's go through the question. The main, the main thing we're looking at here is he has high triglycerides, right? Uh, and then he's given a drug that increases the risk of gallstones and asking what's the mechanism of action. So they want to trick you here by putting D. D is a trick. What the, 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 the drug here is, as you said, fibrates. But fibrates doesn't affect P par gamma, it's actually P par alpha. Yeah. So they wanted to trick you here. And so the real answer here is not D, it's actually A. Yeah. <laughs> P par gamma is actually for a diabetic drug. Um, it's for, they're called glitazones. So that's, so that's, that's a trick. I put, I put this question here just you know, to kind of trick you guys. I'm sorry about that, but yeah. So the answer here is A, cause that is the effect of fibrates, not P par gamma, it's P par alpha. Um, we'll move on to the next question. Okay. A 16 year old boy is brought to the emergency department 20 minutes after collapsing while playing basketball. There's no personal or family history of serious illness. On arrival, there's no palpable pulse and no respiratory effort is seen. He's declared dead. The family agrees to an autopsy, which of the following is most likely to be found in this patient. Okay, first, can anyone tell me what is the disease? What, 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 what could he possibly have? Like, forget about the options that you're given here. What do you think he has? Collapse while playing basketball. Uh, no family history. Any ideas? So it's not dilated cardiomyopathy, it's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, correct? So they, they mentioned here, he is playing basketball, so he's doing some kind of activity. And so the answer here would be E. And so what's seen in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is you see uh, intraventricular septal hypertrophy, and that's what causes a lot of the symptoms because the septum hypertrophies and that causes obstruction. 
And that's what leads to uh, cardiac death. And so this is actually the most common cause of cardiac, sudden cardiac death in athletes under 30. So it doesn't necessarily say that he's an athlete, but they mentioned that he was playing basketball, which got a, that, that should kind of make you think, okay, lean towards, you know, he's doing something more athletic, um, often asymptomatic. And so when we go into the cardiomyopathy, there's two main ones, right? Hypertrophic and dilated. There's also restrictive. So for restrictive, you want to think of anything that ends in osis, sarcoidosis. The main one in your lecture is amyloidosis. You see the apple green bifringence, uh, hemochromatosis, also seen in um, metastatic tumors, uh, radiation. For hypertrophic, it is diastolic dysfunction. And it's what, what happens is known as concentric hypertrophy. So the sarcomeres get added in parallel, which means one after another. So if I kind of draw it here, It'll be like this and like this. So like, and you get kind of like a banana shape, right? And so asymmetrical septal hypertrophy is what leads to the outflow obstruction. And so that's what the answer was here, E. Um, the most common cause is genetics uh, affecting the sarcomere. So uh, myosin binding protein C, beta myosin heavy chain, these are two of them. I believe there's more in the lecture. He, he goes over a lot of them, I remember. And he, I, I remember when he was teaching us, he said, know every single one. I can give you three of this and one of this and ask you which one is which. He didn't bring us any questions on it, but he might bring you guys. I have no idea. Um, for dilated, it's a systolic dysfunction, right? And then what you see in dilated is what's known as eccentric hypertrophy, which is one sarcomeres are added in series. So like this, instead of the next one coming in parallel here, it gets elongated, right? And so that's what causes the dilate, it gets elongated. And so that's what it means by added in series. The most common cause is idiopathic, but it can also be genetic. And so one of the, um, one of the causes is Titan, one of the, the genes. Um, other important causes, and you, sh you should know all these causes, uh, drugs, alcohol-induced cardiomyopathy, important, doxorubicin, important, uh, infection, Coxsackie B, very important. Chagas disease, very important. Um, also, systemic conditions, thyrotoxicosis, beriberi. All of these are very important. Peripartum. Uh, peripartum is uh, pregnancy-induced dilated cardiomyopathy. Also very important to know. Also, dilated is much more common than hyper hypertrophic. Uh, so if you see like these athletes... Uh, maybe in football, basketball, you see them, they have to retire early. A lot of the time it's because of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, next question. A 65-year-old woman comes to the physician because of a three-month history of progressive shortness of breath and a dry cough. She has also noticed gradual development of facial discoloration. She has coronary artery disease, hypertension, AFib. <laughs> she does not remember which medication she takes. Her temperature is 37, uh, pulse 90, respiration is 18, BP 150 over 85. Uh, pulse oximetry shows oxygen saturation 95. Examination shows bluish gray discoloration. Uh, diffuse inspiratory crackles are heard. X-ray of stress shows reticular opacities. Uh, okay, so you guys, okay. <laughs> Before I even got to read the question, you guys already answered. So the answer is indeed F, amadurone. Uh, what makes us think of Madurone? The main, one of the biggest things, they brought this on our OSPI as well, blue-gray discoloration. Uh, inspiratory crackles, what caused, what causes, why does it cause inspiratory crackles? It causes it because um, amadurone leads to pulmonary fibrosis. Now, what basically happens is amadurone acts as a haptin. Now, if anyone knows what a haptin is, if I don't know if anyone, if any of you are good at immunology. Um, a haptin basically causes an immune reaction. So it binds to something and then causes an immune reaction. And so the, so by acting as a haptin, it, it, that's what causes the corneal deposits, the blue gray skin, photodermatitis, all this stuff is caused because it acts as a haptin. In addition to pulmonary fibrosis, it also causes hepatotoxicity and either hypo or hyperthyroidism. And it's important because in the word amiodarone, you have iodine, right? And so 40% of amiodarone is, is uh, iodine. And so because that's what causes the hyperthyroidism. And now it can cause hypothyroidism due to just a direct toxic effect of the drug on the thyroid. And so anytime if you're giving amiodarone, you should always check the pulmonary uh, PFT, LFT, and TFTs. 
Very important. Uh, we mentioned earlier, block the potassium channels, prolongs phase three. Phase three, that can lead to uh, QT prolongation as well. Uh, and yeah, AP action potential. Anyways, uh, any questions about amidron? No questions, okay. Next question. So a 45 year old man comes to the physician because of a one month history of fever and poor appetite. Five, five weeks ago, he underwent molar extraction for dental caries, his temperature is 38, cardiac exam shows two out of six, holosystolic murmur. Blood culture shows gram positive, catalase negative, cockeye. Transesophageal echocardiography shows a small vegetation on the mitral valve with mild regurgitation. The casual organism, the causal organism, most likely has which of the following characteristics. This is more of a micro question. Yeah, so the answer here is D, correct. Um, what is D? What is, what, what is the agent? What is the bacteria? Subverted. Okay, as we said earlier, uh, sequelae of dental procedures, uh, we said gram positive, catalase negative. That's strep. Uh, that's also show give like points of source strep verdans. Uh, mitral valve regurg, right? So we already went over infective endocarditis. Uh, this is just more of like a micro element. So one of the uh, uh, violence factors is production of dextrans. Now, uh, does anyone know? what the dextrans does? Yeah, close enough. It's, it's basically, yeah, it, it, it causes um, fibrin platelet uh, deposits. And so that, that's, it's, it basically um, causes inflammation, which causes the vegetation to form. Exactly. Uh, Next question. A 19 year old woman comes to the physician because of episodic bilateral finger pain and discoloration that occurs in cold weather. Her fingers turn white, then blue, before eventually returning to normal color. The symptoms have been occurring daily and limit her ability to work. She has no history of serious illness and takes no, no medication. She does not smoke. Uh, phys physical exam shows normal capillary refill of the nail beds, radial pulse is palpable bi bi bilaterally. The remainder of the examination shows no abnormalities, which the following is the most appropriate pharmacotherapy. So first, what is the disease? What does she, what is, uh, what does she have? She has Raynaud's phenomenon. So what is the treatment of Raynaud's phenomenon? Does anyone know? Not answered. Uh, so the answer here is D, calcium channel blockers. And so the reason is because calcium channel blockers cause vasodilation. And the main problem in Raynaud's phenomenon is vasoconstriction, right? That's what causes pallor and then cyanosis. And so by giving calcium channel blockers, you stop the vasoconstriction with the vasodilator effect. Uh, initially, obviously, you want to you want to um, use more conservative things like you want to tell them to avoid the cold, avoid stress, avoid anything that will uh, trigger the Raynaud's phenomenon. But in terms of pharm pharmacotherapy, specifically, uh, nifedipine or calcium channel blockers in general. Uh, this I remember this 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 was in this is in the clinical lecture, so and probably important that you know it. Uh, Why is beta blocker? Uh, so that's because this beta blocker specifically, metoprolol is a beta one blocker. So meaning it's cardio selective. Exactly. Exactly. And so it won't really help. No problem. Uh, okay, next question. 
It's also an easy one. A uh, 50 year old man comes to the physician with elevate, uh, for the evaluation of recurrent episodes of chest pain, rapid heart beating over the past two months. During this period, he had lost uh, 8.8 .8 pounds. He has malaise, pain in both knees, diffuse muscle pain. Five years ago, he was diagnosed with chronic head B and was started on tenofovir. His temperature is 38, pulse is 110, blood pressure is 150 over 90. CBP exam shows no abnormalities except for tachycardia. There are several ulcerations around the ankle and calves bilaterally. Lab studies are shown. What is the most likely diagnosis? Okay, yeah, exactly. D, polyarthritis nodos. Uh, we said earlier that it is associated with head B. It's high association. I believe it's 30% association. Um, that, is, that is the main thing that you're looking at here. Um, we, I, I kind of mentioned most of the main things in all the vasculitis earlier, so I, I won't go over them again. Uh, but for this question specifically, uh, the, the thing that gives it away, like that on, is the happy. Um, I believe I have one more question. A 61 year old man is brought to the emergency department by ambulance because of severe retrospiratory chest pain and shortness of breath for 30 minutes. Paramedics report that an ECG recorded en route to the hospital shows ST elevation in one, AVL in the precordial leads. On arrival, the patient is unresponsive to the painful stimuli. Examination shows neither respir respiration nor pulse. Despite appropriate life-saving measures, he dies 10 minutes later. Which of the following is the most likely cause of death in this patient? Yeah, correct. Uh, answer here is F. That is, as I mentioned earlier, that is the most important um, thing that you want to look out for like shortly after MI because it leads to sudden cardiac death. Um, exactly. That, that, is, that is it for my questions. If anyone has any questions for me, feel free to ask. Um, I hope the session was beneficial. I tried to get questions from you know different sources on different topics uh i suggest every one of you do robin's questions all of robin's because it's very helpful for the exam if you know what i mean um i i remember one question for us came from robin's and then we we didn't appeal it because we knew what the answer was because it was in robin's but they accepted two answers anyways but yeah, go through Robbins, make sure you finish it, every question, because it will show up on your exam. And go through all the pictures, uh, because he, especially abroad, he will bring the same exact picture. Sometimes not even, like the clinical visionette doesn't even matter. You just look at the picture and then you'll know, okay, this is, this is the disease. And it, it'll help you time-wise, um, yeah. So if you have any questions, do you recommend Robin? Yeah, I mean, I why can't we use the nitrate for that? Um, okay, let me go back to the where was it? Okay. Um, so what is the what is what is what is the mechanism of action of nitrates? Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll share I'll share the slides with you guys. I'll share it with uh, whoever the uh, Palatina. So what, what, what nitrates do is they release nitric oxide causing vasodilation, right? And so mainly um, what you wanna use it for is like angina or acute coronary syndrome. It's not, it's not used as like first line therapy for Raynaud's phenomenon. You can possibly use it, like it is used, but first line and what you wanna use first is Nifedipine, pharmacotherapy wise. Obviously, initially, as I said, you want to do more non invasive, you want to do uh, non pharmacological therapy, keep them away from the cold, anything that triggers it. But if you need to use pharmacotherapy, the first line is uh, calcium channel blockers. And then you can probably, if it's therapy resistant, you can use uh, nitrates. Any other questions? one question I mentioned to troponin. 
this one. Um, no, it's not elevated. These, uh, so they, sometimes they, they, they like to, they like to show you some stuff to kind of throw you off. Like they'll, they'll add stuff. They're, that's just there to, you know, try to put you off what the real answer is. But uh, in my opinion, whenever you're looking at a question, um, let me, let me find an example. Let's say, let's say this question, right? If whenever you're looking at the question, what you want to look at first, you want to look at what is the chief complaint? So for instance, here, sudden onset palpitations and dyspnea, it's a chief complaint. Then you also want to look at what are they asking? These are the two things that are the most important. So they're asking which of the following physiologic factors most likely determines ventricular contract contraction rate. So these are the two important lines. Then you can go into, okay, significant hypertension, GERD, whatever. Then you go into the rest of the question. So you read the chief complaint, you read what they're asking, then you can, Sometimes even just reading those two lines will get you, will, you can get the answer from that alone. But if you see like a longer clinical visionette, then you should probably read the whole thing. But I think sometimes you get like shorter questions in, in the actual exam. So sometimes just, just those two lines alone will get you the right answer. But those are the two most important. Uh, any other questions? Okay, if there are no other questions, then I will, I will end it there. Uh, thank you guys for coming. I hope this was beneficial for you guys. Um, yeah, no problem. Uh, I want to thank the growth and development team for bringing me here, the PAL team. And yeah. I hope the questions weren't too difficult. I tried to try to kind of bring a mix, you know. But yeah, that's all that's all from my side.